a few of these names are Dr. John Mack, Dr. Angela Thompson, Dr. Scott Mandelker, Dr. Nick Begich, Dr. L. Joe Hasselhoff, Dr. Stephen Greer, Dr. Ted Loader, Dr. James McKinney, Dr. Roger Lear, Dr. Claude Swanson. I'm sure that I forgot some people. I apologize for that. But these are just a few of the names, guys. Think about it. Hard scientists, doctors that have come forward to speak and to tell us more truth about the subjects for which we're all looking for answers. Now we welcome Dr. Norman Berggren. Now, you only have just like a thumbnail sketch of his scientific and academic achievement in your program. Guys, it's as long as both arms and both legs. It is. And yet, think about this. Dr. Norman Berggren, we're welcoming him here today, but it's been almost 20 years ago that he published his book, The Rings of Saturn. 20 years ago, this great credentialed man of science actually risked everything to come forward to tell us some truth. 20 years ago almost. He was a pioneer, a great man. Ladies and gentlemen, please give your warmest possible welcome to Dr. Norman Berggren. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Bob, for that wonderful introduction. And I have a little memento here that uh, depicts uh, how far we've come in 100 years. And you'll see how far some other people have already come in my presentation. So this, this is sort of a, a memento of, of aerospace. Oh. Norman. Norman, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'll, I will treasure this memento. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Are you ready for all of this now? Okay. Uh, I'm going to sort of brief you on what you might expect during the presentation so you have a feel of where this thing is going and uh, so that you're not taken back completely by surprise uh, during the presentation. Um, now, the title of ET Intelligence, and I added a, a tag line that says the open secret. Well, uh, I'm going to show you some vehicles. Now, vehicles are is a generic term, and it can be applied to biotic kinds of things, or it can indeed apply to a craft. Uh, for example, you're a vehicle for something, and so that's what I mean by that term being very generic. Um, now I'm going to show you first uh, a couple of uh, vehicles that owe to my own personal sighting. And then some other instances will be sighted using NASA images. Um, and then uh, I'm going to point out technological characteristics that, uh, of these vehicles that will be developed. Uh, they're advanced. Now this advanced technology is what gives the inference of intelligence in the high IQ range. Uh, now, there are some events that occurred on the moon and around the moon, and these will be shown for Apollos 12, 13, and 14. And the open secret pertains to NASA images and data being open to the public. Uh, for example, Voyager and Hubble and other missions. They're available to the public on the web, but not enough images to disclose much of anything. You can't work with those images. And thereby, we've got a secret that is open. Uh, it, it, it's a secret staring you in the face, but <laughs> uh, there's no closure to it. Well, 
uh, like some others that appeared before me, uh, we're trying to get closure on that. Now, uh, I'm supposed to have a uh, slide thing here. Now that's my uh, first slide that sets up a, a calibrate. Okay, now uh, there's the title slide and I've explained about the, uh, about the title so we can, we can move on. I don't know what happened to that one. Uh, there should be another one before that. Okay, well, I'll tell you a story about this airplane. It's an Orion P3 airplane, and uh, its gross weight is 127,500 pounds. It can carry 60,000 gallons of fuel, and uh, it can carry uh, well of a load of armament, uh, you know, like uh, 10 torpedoes, uh, depth charges of all types, and um, uh, being a submarine hunter airplane, why um, they've got all kinds of other equipment on board. Uh, they have redundant equipment for safety. Uh, it's, a, it's an airplane that has lived through a long period of time. And even today, its, um, uh, uh, it, its upgrade model is still flying. And so that gives you an idea of an airplane that has lived a long life. Now, uh, this airplane vanished off the California coast near Point Sur with eight crew members aboard. And the date was May 27th, 1972. Uh, the last radio contact was over what was the, uh, then known as the Salinas uh, radio beacon. And this beacon is located on the coast and practically directly, directly west of the town of Salinas. Now, if anyone would like to see the full content of the, uh, the news clip, uh, why see me afterwards uh, when, uh, when we're at the book table. Um, now, I've told you about the, some of the characteristics. It has four, 4,300 horsepower engines. And so when you add the torpedoes, the 13 depth bombs of different sizes, six mines, 1,000 pounders, and three 2,000 pounders, you got a whale a lot of equipment that was lost off of Point Sur. Uh, the commanding officer of the day for the squadron uh, was actually, according to the uh, press article, just befuddled because he could not imagine how an airplane like that could vanished, literally vanished. There was no oil trace in the search. They really scoured things and they came up with nothing. So this airplane just really disappeared along with the, the people aboard. Well, we'll tell you a little bit more about that in, in conjunction with um, some things that um, happened uh, on Monterey Bay. Now, the Point Sur is located slightly south of the Monterey Ray area, and um, it's about halfway. Uh, now, that's a, a very dim slide, so you have to tune that up. There we go. <coughs> uh, you see Monterey Bay there? And get out a pointer. Okay, Pajara Dunes is about halfway down here, and uh, Santa Cruz is up in here, and Monterey, of course, is down there in, in this corner right there. Monterey is down at the bottom corner, and uh, Pajara Dunes, which is labeled, uh, you can see quite clearly. Okay, so in September of 1971, I was at Pajara Dunes. We had spent a week vacation there, and this was the last day, the full day that we we're going to be there. And I, I 
was laying flat on my back at Pahara Dunes, looking, looking up this way. And when I did that, why I saw a bright, very bright light, intense light. And uh, I thought at first it was a, a huge Navy helicopter crossing the bay. I had seen those before, and uh, I, I thought, surely that was it. And the sun had been over my back, and, and so it was shining towards uh, what would have been the windscreen of the uh, airplane. But uh, after a while, it became evident that no windscreen could produce the <laughs> reflections that I was beginning to see. And so uh, at this juncture, I ran and got a binocular and uh, took a sighting on it. And what I found was we have here a model. Can you see that? The, the uh, thing that I saw was a silvery vehicle that was uh, long. Uh, its diameter was maybe about one thirteenth of its length. Um, it uh, had azure blue flames at each end, and it, it kept going through capabilities that it had. Um, what happened next was that two flames rod-like flames shot out, indicated by these two uh, elements. And then between those two elements was a black rod kind of thing. And when it reached the end of where the flame-like pair were, a huge, intense light was formed, like, like an arc light. Now, you probably are wondering, what these are. First, let me tell you that underneath the nose there was flame-like characteristics too. I, I call that part a mustache for the, for the vehicle. Now, the streamers, there were pairs of streamers. One from each side would come up and coalesce together. And there were a number of these, and I've shown three here with the model. The uh, streamers, uh, were pinched plasma. That is, there's a ball of plasma that would come out. Uh, plasma, there, there is um, uh, four states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, and, and plasma. And that means that it's gas at high temperature. Um, so it would belch out a globule of plasma, and then it would pinch down, and then another globule would move up. And so these, these uh, Globules would just move along here with a successive one being coming out from the, uh, the, the vehicle. Okay, so that was the case. The interesting thing about uh, these streamers were that they were uh, a sickening chartreuse, that is a yellow green. And um, that means that there was chlorine in that streamer. And this would uh, be enough to upset uh, our ozone layer, is to get some of that chlorine there. That's, that's an easy way to do it. OK, so um, I realized as the aft end was being, uh, being uh, covered over with a cloud-like character, that I, I best go and try to take a picture before I lost all of the uh, all the picture over its whole length. And that I did, and I was successful in getting one picture that it, while it's all clouded up from here to about <laughs> in here, still you can tell that uh, there is a body in there, and you're going to see that. It took me a long while to figure that out, but because uh, it was so hard to, to get out of the uh, film that I had. Uh, there is a, a quick pictorial of, uh, of this model uh, that I drew very soon after I got home just to record uh, basically how it looked. It may not be exact proportion, but it does show the characteristics that, is, uh, that were there. And 
But those streamers look a little bit more um, chartreuse-y. Now, this element here, I, I wanted to draw it to your attention because a streamer looked more like that in being pinched plasma, more sinusoidal and, and more harmonious to the eye. Um, now that drawing there for the body, uh, it rests in there. If this is the nose, then uh, as you see it, the aft end is farther behind the picture than the front end. So uh, you can't quite see the nose completely as an ellipse, but uh, those kinds of uh, details are what tell you uh, how a body is, is viewed with respect to your eyesight. Okay. Now here is uh, my picture from our condo deck. Our, our deck was uh, like that deck, and I had my camera resting on, on a rail, like, like one of these rails. And I was shooting towards Santa Cruz, as you can see. And you can see that the, everything is all clouded up here. Um, you see a dark spot, which uh, indicates something's there, and uh, so on. Um, I don't know whether you can see the a one here and a one down here, uh, but that's where the body is located. And then there's a, a projection from the body, which is labeled two. Now, this is a blow up, which makes it more clear that there was a body right in here. It, it, this curve says that this thing is rounded. And uh, here is a cloud structure that's there. And um, it, the body's labeled one between these two ones. And then there's a projection here. Excuse me. Yes. When you face the screen, you can't hear you because you're not speaking into the mic. Okay. Right into that mic. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there is a projection from the sign here, and uh, that's label two. You can see some rising elements up here for three, and they're fairly substantial, and so you can get some indication of what's uh, making the clouding effect. Now, uh, there was in December, as I recall, uh, I made a sighting from my place at a high point uh, from Los Altos Hills. Um, and this had been going on for some time and I finally got off my duff and um, photographed this object. It had shown itself as a, as a multicolored glimmering light and I finally decided, hey, we've got to, got to get to know more about that thing. And at the top here uh, is a streamer, and right in here is the end, and here is uh, some cloud-like structure, and here is the other end in here. And you can see it has some color to it, uh, and it's not just uh, just white, uh, but all of that twinkles. And um, so when you look up in the sky, if you see something that's intensely bright and uh, it twinkles different colors and you see some streamers popping out um, like I showed you, uh, that's not an airplane because it shoots out these streamers in all directions. And so you can be, you get more interest that way in what you're looking at and understand it. Now, uh, I want to know where this vehicle was geometrically. And okay, they've got the picture <coughs> tuned up here so that you can see that we did a sighting from Los Altos Hills, and I was down in Santa Cruz, and um, my wife was in Los Altos Hills, and she made a bearing fix on the, on the thing, and at agreed time, why well, I made my sighting uh, on the Santa Cruz beach, and what you see there 
is um, two lines that intersect. And they intersect about uh, 60 miles off of the coast and uh, about 65 statute miles uh, away from uh, Point Sur, which is lower down. Now, I'm going to mention uh, the loss of the uh, Akron or the Macon uh, graph zeppelin. And, and it is a zeppelin, it's not a grass zeppelin, but it, it's from the German design zeppelin. Um, I knew Colonel Walter Gaspar, who was the officer of the day at the time the Macon went down. And I remember his saying, well, it went down off of Point Sur. And I thought, well, gee, that's interesting. And so during the preparation for this talk, uh, I searched around and, uh, and I found lo and behold, the coordinates of where it went down. And as a matter of fact, having those coordinates, the historical department of the Lakehurst Naval Station wrote me and asked me, what coordinates did you find out? Because they would like to record that. So uh, yeah, it was a little work to do that, but it was a lot of fun. Um, now, if that could be lightened up so people could see it better. But that is the, the Macon ship. And it went down. Uh, off of Point Sur, and its coordinates um, are just a degree away in terms of latitude, and only a few minutes away in terms of, of um, let's see, one degree away in terms of longitude, and just minutes away in terms of latitude. And uh, this thing carried 83 people, lots of gear. It's capable of carrying airplanes. It's a warship. And um, it went down in practically the location where um, we made our sighting. Um, now, the Orion airplane, the Orion airplane, um, went down in the same area. Uh, so here we have a couple of warships. Uh, that have gone down off of, uh, of Point Sur. And I think the characteristic, the fact that there were capabilities, this thing could carry four airplanes, um, it begins to tell us something about uh, what we can expect in terms of attitude from our extraterrestrial friends that obviously are out there. So, well, that's my own opinion. Maybe you won't disagree with me. I, I'm part of of all of you trying to put pieces of a puzzle together, and uh, I don't mean to uh, try to belittle that in any way. It's, uh, it's another piece of the puzzle. Okay, now we're gonna move on to talking about Saturn, and uh, if that could be brightened up, it's going the wrong way. Uh, the the thing about this chart is that um, it shows that between the encounter that Voyager 1 had on the date that's given there, 12 November, and then Voyager 2 came along, there's only nine months difference in the, um, in the time that these two missions uh, were conducted. <coughs> Now the party line, and I use party line as uh, what NASA says, you know, this is what we're gonna tell the public. And they, they stick to a party line for a while and then it, when they see that's not gonna work, why they come up with another party line. Much the same as they do in politics. Um, the story was at the time that rings were made of primordial matter. The rings were essentially static and that there was no <coughs> material in the Cassini division. Well, when I took notes of Voyager 1 encounter live on TV, and I had about a stack four inch thick of, of notes and then Voyager 2 came along, lo and behold, there was stuff in the Cassini division, and that was, that was sort of a no-no. That was not expected. So, 
So now they've changed the, the party line to say it's broken up moons and um, big ice chunks out there and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, going on, I want to familiarize you with the, the names of the rings. Uh, way out of the tip there, there, there is an A ring, or an F ring, and you move in, and that's a real tiny, insignificant ring. Then you move into the A ring, and um, then uh, the A ring has a division in it called the Enki division. So, and that Enki division moves like from 25% away from the outer edge to about 25% away from the inner edge. So that Enki division can move around. Now, um, going on towards the B ring, before you get to the B ring, you find the Cassini division. And there it's pictured with some material in it. Then there is the entire B ring, and right beside it, the C ring, and beside that, the D ring. Uh, by and large, we'll be dealing only with the A ring. Oh, there's the front cover of, of my book. The orange spot that you see there uh, will come for discussion a little later on, but uh, this is a spot of energy that's adjacent to uh, the left side of, of the A-ring. Okay, now that slide is intentionally dark because that's the way uh, it was, it was made in the first place. Um, it's a little too dark here, though. Um, yeah, there we go. Now, in looking at this dark slide, what I noticed was that I could follow the ring around on the top side, but down at the bottom, <laughs> I was unable to do it. Uh, you see the rings are, are labeled here. Um, now, there is a luminous source here, and that's the luminous source I pointed out that's on the front cover of the book. It's on, on the left side. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, I've labeled one and two here, and we'll discuss these things in order. And you'll find that uh, down here, it was impossible to find the ring because it was not there. This is a, a depiction of, of the situation, and this is sort of a, a picture of, uh, of size. The various rings are labeled on the left, and um, you see that 10 Earth diameters approximately, or the diameter of Saturn, and that the width of the, the total width of the ring system on, on one side is like six uh, Earth diameters long. So that makes a, a total width of the system 22 Earth diameters, and that, that's a well of a large distance. <coughs> now, the other thing about this picture is that when the ring is cut off across the uh, Cassini division there, uh, you get a large length for um, whatever is across there. And, uh, and that, I have two vertical lines coming down, and so for that much of the ring is shown there, that's two and a half Earth diameters. So you begin to get a feel for the length of an object that might be there. <coughs> now, there we go. You see, I've labeled the B ring and this luminous source. That's the one on the left, and it's the one on the book cover. And, and uh, that thing is larger in diameter than our moon. So that's a big chunk of energy to be sitting out there besides the ring. 
Now, when I first discovered that the ring was cut off, I was actually mystified. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the mystery came from realizing that the ring was incomplete circularly. But I finally, it dawned on me that, hey, you know, this ring is not there radially either because uh, typically the ring width for the A ring should be something like four, uh, four times the, the width of the Cassini division. And here we find that we're lucky if we get maybe two, something of that nature. Well, that helped a lot because um, now you know all of the A ring is not there in addition to uh, the ring not being completely circular. And uh, so you know that something is going on. They got me lined up so that when I talk about these pictures, that it sounds much better, okay? So we've got to thank our staff here. They're really right on the ball. I've, I've been impressed with all their capabilities. Um, now, this long optic that's in here um, is what terminates the ring. And when you examine it more in detail, you find that there's a little exhaust there and a little down in here. And uh, here's a light source below it. And uh, then there are some streamers that form here, this, these white things I call the streamers. And they, they go up into the ring. And uh, you can see that there's a body of some sort there. And so, whoa, now I understand how the rings are made in as much as there is nothing in the way of a ring beyond the end of the cylindrical body. Um, and uh, that nails it down, that there's nothing further out other than what's, uh, what you see uh, portrayed by the length of the, of the body. Now, what I tried to do later on was to identify characteristics to say, well, what kind of body? Um, and that turned out to be electrical. And so you now you have a heads up view of, of how that's going. Now, this slide I have presented because uh, there has been a gent that has made up a story about this figure here, which I just showed you, that he did not believe that what I had was the right picture, but he, submitted that this one was correct. Well, I've put some numbers up here. The first one here is one that says there's a light below the nose. You see, there's no light below this nose, and that wipes him out right there. Um, here is a texture of the A-ring. The texture of that looks different than this. And um, so he's off base on that. They don't look right in the rings. And for this one, there's a little streamer up in here. It's very hard to see in this image. But this one has a big, broad image uh, coming here. And you can see some of these uh, pinch plasma things going up there. So in addition, this one has some blue uh, appearance down here. Uh, the, the other one does not. So the, the fellow was really off base. And uh, the reason he got off base was that he did not understand that um, there's several levels of data processing. He had the zero level of data processing. He had raw information. That raw information is corrected to uh, level one. And then there's level two that has only 
uh, pictures that are designed for land where you take a look at a picture and, and adjust it so uh, it, it lines up with uh, longitudinal lines and that kind of thing. So he mistook himself with regard to, uh, to the characteristic of, of the images. Now he asserted that there were four images that were stacked on top of one another to create um, the colored image that you see there for, for, uh, for my picture. Well, it turns out that uh, when you get the process data, why there are extensions on the rings that if you line them up uh, for color purposes, these things would stick out and you would know it. And uh, that's the other thing that I pointed out. And so his case fails miserably. And uh, so I present this here because uh, he's been all over the net with it. And, and, but he, he's just a book salesman and he really doesn't have the talent to, to know what he's doing. Okay, now we're going to the other side. And most everything's labeled there for you that you can see. Uh, you're acquainted now with the A ring and the B ring and the Cassini division. And that luminous source. Now here, the luminous source doesn't look orange because this image is uh, one that um, is highly exposed in order to bring out these various features. But you can see a little bit of exhaust there for uh, the longitudinal object. And you can see body emissions that go up into the ring. And uh, the thing I wanted to talk to you about was that there is a toroid on a, on a curved arm that goes up from down in here. And um, around a conductor carrying electricity, uh, you could have material gather as a toroid. And, um, and that's because of the way the magnetic field exists around the conductor. Now, this is supposed to be an example of a conductor. It's a little blanked out. Uh, it's a little overexposed. There we go. There we go. Um, I've taken a plane just across the conductor at right angles and given you the direction of the current flow. And under that setup, uh, you, you get a concentric magnetic field around that conductor. And so you can think of that plane as being one element of a toroid, which is a really a donut-shaped object. And so a number of, of little spaces to each side of this uh, would contribute to making a donut shape or a toroid. Uh, and uh, a number of those could be made all, all along the conductor. So now you're beginning to see that uh, it has some electromagnetic characteristics. Okay, we're back to this, and why we are going back to this is that um, you see these streamers come up in here. Well, there's other action in here, and you can vaguely see it right here that go back. Uh, when uh, streamers cross each other at right angles, you know darn well that there is an electrical field there. And I drew this to bring out that idea that I saw in those rings, so it, it's clear as to what I'm talking about. The streamers come up from down below and uh, like that, and then there's some streamers on the body that flow aft, and they intersect essentially at right angles, and that tells you that that field is an electrical field. Otherwise, uh, they would not intersect at right angles. So now you begin to see it's electromagnetic in character. And uh, just from these two points, um, I feel that we can name these vehicles EMVs, electromagnetic vehicles, uh, because it does describe uh, essentially the, the characteristics that they possess. Uh, I said the title of the slide there is orthogonality of the streamers. Well, that word means perpendicularity, so it's the same thing. 
Now here is a flow field around a cylinder. Now what I want you to do is to envision that on the, on the top side here, there's a, a plate and you have a battery and this is a positive side and down at the bottom there's a plate and that's the negative side. Okay, um, and you have a circle in a medium here that would enable current to flow from here to here. Um, all right, what happens is these, these, what you recognize as streamlines around the circle can be uh, viewed as potential lines. And the reason they're electrical potential lines is, is because they're lining up with, the, with this plate up here that's at some value, and, and one line is actually a straight line. And it gets closer to this way, it takes on the curvature of this. And um, the same way on the opposite side of the axis. Now, you also know that current is flowing from the top here to the bottom. And so those current lines will be perpendicular everywhere on their trip to the other side. And that demonstrates the perpendicularity of, uh, of flow that represents electromagnetic characteristic. Now, what happened at um, Voyager 2 when it passed the rings of Saturn? Uh, it's interesting in that we had aboard a plasma probe ring detector. So that we're, we're examining, pro, uh, examining uh, plasma in the uh, ring. And uh, so that, um, you know, heretofore nobody has um, acknowledged that the rings can contain plasma. So, well, here's a little graph that um, I'll show what the ring thickness is for this particular thing. Now, mind you, ring thickness is thought of as being only about 10 miles thick. That is what is being toted right now. It's 10 miles or less. And uh, yes, the rings can get that thin, but they can also be quite thick, depending upon how close to a, a, one of these uh, EMVs uh, that the measurement is taken by because they, they are thick, and so the stuff that came out will be thick in that locality. All right, now going on here, this curve is the path of Voyager 2 past the ring. Now, in a very short interval here, um, the instrument is, is working away, and it's creating a, a time history of what it sees in the way of plasma. Now, uh, the instrument works with different frequencies, so it can sense plasma in different frequencies. And the way it's recorded is in decibels. So when you get some blip, some blips here, why, um, uh, that's, that's the measurement. So nothing will happen for a while, and then all of a sudden you get a blip across here, and that trace will continue. The same way all along here, you see it's time between here and here, and um, there are these little spreads all along here. Um, now you can calculate the uh, thickness of the ring by distance equals velocity times time. And you do know the velocity of the uh, spacecraft and you know uh, the time because it's recorded. And so what you do is to take the little difference in time represented by a spread of one of these little uh, normal distribution kinds of curves in there, and that will give you the, uh, the ring thickness. Now, you notice that on the left side, uh, the uh, the, the length of those rises are is greater than on the top side. Here it looks like very little. So this means that you're going to get a spread in the, um, in the, in the numbers that you assert are the thickness of, uh, of, of the ring. And indeed you do. Uh, I got 435 to over 600 
uh, miles before that. Okay, that is a large distance. Uh, and this is the only sample that I know of that uh, says that you can have really thick rings. And the reason is that there's an object in there and this, this time they measured one fairly close to the object and got a, a fairly large number for thickness. Now, if it had been measured at another point, say, well aft of a body that was in there, um, they wouldn't have seen a thick ring at all. It, it would have been uh, like a contrail from an airplane. It would have faded off, and um, they would have done a uh, much less value for the uh, ring thickness. So when you talk to people about ring thickness, you can say, well, it can vary all over the place. <clears throat> now, here is a, an interesting picture, at least to me. Uh, before I uh, published Ring Makers of Saturn, I, I went through uh, astronomy literature to see if I couldn't find something that um, uh, was similar to what I had, if that was all possible. And this is the one that seemed most appropriate. Uh, here is a picture of Saturn, and um, it's labeled Passage of a Star. Um, there were two astronomers, Knight and Ainsley, in Great Britain, and they were both astronomers, but working at different laboratories. And Knight spotted a, what he called a, a star, uh, as much as it was very intensely lit, uh, passing through the ring of Saturn. And you see that the path it's on is also the same path where we found the clipped ring for uh, uh, Saturn in what I've showed you before. So this is why it struck me as being a very applicable uh, kind of thing. And uh, Knight followed that along uh, into the uh, Cassini division, and that's about where Ainsley picked it up because it was such a clear spot to be in. He could see it. And he could see it. And um, both, both jets, when they got together afterwards, uh, composed a composite picture there that you can see that. It, it was on the straight line course going through the uh, Cassini division and, and out. Now, Knight said that, uh, gee, this thing really ate its way right through the ring with no problem. And he was really amazed. And as a matter of fact, this is uh, one of the uh, famous, you might say, uh, accomplishments of the time. Uh, it was felt that uh, it was proven by this that there was nothing in the A ring. Well, that may have been true once, but it, that's no longer true, as you know, because uh, we, we see stuff in the Cassini division. Now we're going to take you out to Miranda, which is a, uh, it's a uh, satellite of Uranus. Uh, uh, you lost me on this one. Doesn't look like it needs to be lightened up a little bit. Okay, um, this looks completely different from anything I have seen in this picture. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll go through it. Um, my original thought was that uh, this object right here was a part of a continuous object that goes through here. Actually, what it looks like, the object is here and goes way down through here. So. Uh, I have to change my mind about the way this picture looks. But nevertheless, uh, this looks like a, a short uh, EMV right through here. 
and there's a, a, a streamer that rises right up there. And then there is, uh, this would be the end. You can see it's sort of circular in character and it has a, a protrusion down below it. And that is characteristic of the kind of thing that I saw at Pahara Dunes. Um, and then there is um, projection material out here. And that too is characteristic of one of these EMVs. Now it looks like that in fact there are, in the way they got them loaded up here, that there is another object right in here and uh, that it has a lateral protrusion way out here uh, and uh, there is emission from it. Uh, the, the thing that I think is so significant about this picture is that these elements right down here at the bottom, they're thin little things labeled eight and nine. I, I call them energy rolls because uh, obviously these EMVs can um, use something and they carry along with them so that they can make any kind of form that they want. And so to, to me, these elements along here are um, stores, such as like a fighter airplane carries torpedoes and so forth, they call that stores. And, um, now, with those in position there, you see they've controlled all the emissions that have come out of that area. Um, and they've done it deliberately, um, and underneath there, why be, they probably have something that we'd like to know about. Um, so it, it shows that they're capable of managing their their, their image. Uh, look, and <clears throat> now that they're electromagnetic, that means that uh, they can do this uh, to make any shape they want, an infinite number of shapes. And so what you find is that um, in being an infinite number of shapes, you can't, you, you think you're seeing things are different from time to time. Well, in a way that is true, but it's all coming from one kind of unit. And it just has varying things that it can do. And so these varying things can look different so that you lose the significant idea that there is one basic thing that's, that's showing all these peculiar things. Now, how are ring makers as UFOs? Well, the answer to that question is they make darn good UFOs. At the top of the picture to the left, uh, now first let me say the little black bar where we're, wherever it appears is uh, just a simple representation of, a, of an EMV. Now, uh, on the top to the left, why it shows a, a hump on the top and the bottom. Uh, to the right of that, why that hump and uh, what's uh, around there it could make it look like a hat. And um, the central picture would be a cross section of that and it would look, look that way. Uh, now they can have uh, emissions that are not circular, but they can shape them so it looks like that. Um, but they also can um, make any number of different occurrences so <laughs> it could be square for that matter. Now you go down to the uh, lower left corner and you see an L-shaped object. You have an EMV projecting only to the right and um, so you get an L-shape. And as a matter of fact, I've seen an account of an L-shape and that's, that's how you do it. Um, you could have uh, the projection on the other side so it looks different. Okay, and so on the right lower hand corner you have a lenticular cloud-like formation and you have the EMV in it. Um, that's a typical kind of thing that they can pull. Uh, and uh, you see a lenticular cloud, uh, quite possibly there's an EMV in there. So you can see that they, they have qualities that uh, make them candidates for making UFOs. But we've got to get into the mode of uh, IFOs, where we identify things 
And this begins to bring things to a closure and understanding. So the EMV is a long cylindrical object now. It's electromagnetic in character. And we should be referring to that as an IFO. Now they have stuff that they give off and we should begin now to label the stuff they give off. And we only know uh, if that's, if we can find the uh, EMV at the time and, and begin to piece all this stuff together. It'd be a fascinating thing to, uh, to find all the capabilities. Here is a, a cover that, uh, of, of a report that was put out by the uh, UNESCO under the auspices of the uh, uh, National of Da Vinci in Rome. Um, the reason why I show that is, is that um, I was at Rome where they put on a Congress uh, and they wanted to have something on the nature of impact of science on culture. And that's the charter of UNESCO. Um, so I chose the idea that weather was a common thing and I had already decided that our weather could be messed up with the presence of these things because of the, these plasma streamers and so forth. And, and I showed the pictures essentially that I've showed you and said, well, now, uh, weather is not going to be what it used to be. And that certainly has been the case. This was 1987, and uh, I'm very proud that uh, what I said there has come true. So there is a lot of truth in this in as much as uh, I've seen this happen over a period of quite a few years now. And um, so I, I, I want to tie those things together. Um, now, I've been uh, warned about bringing up global warming debate heats up and record very well. Uh, the, the thought here is that uh, this is the way things are going to go with EMVs being present. I, I'm not trying to uh, step on anybody's toes here with regard to environment or anything like that, but uh, all I'm trying to say in putting the pieces of this puzzle together, we have a new variable that's not being considered. And the variable is uh, these EMVs. And they have prodigious energy, as I showed you from that one uh, luminous source that's larger than the diameter of our moon. And uh, so it could also cause the ice to melt and so forth. So uh, that, that's the only kind of thing that I wanted to get across on that. Now we're going to go to Apollo 12 and uh, Pete Conrad was the chief domo in that flight, and Gordon stuck with the orbiting spacecraft, and we went along with Gordon. Okay, this is supposed to be Pete. No, no, it's supposed to be Dean out there uh, on what I've labeled item one. And the item two is a solar wind collector that is supposed to be there. Um, the solar wind collector has a little flag-like kind of thing that, that you don't see in this view, but uh, so that the, the cosmic particles can hit it. Okay, so this is advertised on the net by Eric Jones, who is the author of the article. Well, there, there's Bean out there. And uh, he looks like he's taking a picture of us, that little white spot. Looks like a camera to him, um, and uh, and it does look like an astronaut. He look there. It looks like there's legs here, and uh, so. But let's go take a closer look at that. Well, he, he's moved here in this the same kind of thing. It looks like he's turned around, and maybe he's going to shoot a picture over to the left. Now we'll we'll take a picture of. There, that's the first one. Um, you see, it's not not an astronaut at all. It, it's some sort of a of a body. Uh, item one points to uh, 
uh, a body kind of thing. And the only thing that made you think that it was an astronaut was all this shading with light here. And there's the little camera blurb that now they thought well, he's taking a camera. Uh, but when you look up close at the leg, uh, hey, this is not an astronaut dress suit at all. It's, it's some sort of object. Okay, here is the second view. And uh, I don't know whether they like to contrast this arm out here or not, but there is an arm out here and it looks like a head sort of thing. And uh, it's only this lighting effect that makes you believe from a distance that there is an astronaut out there. But that is not an astronaut, that is not being, no way. Um, the fact that there is an arm out this way uh, makes the thing look uh, biotically like a robot. Okay, now uh, this is supposed to be Pete Conrad. Um, you know, the commanding officer always puts up the flag and so um, the thought of Greg Jones was, and of course, that is Pete Conrad there. He's, uh, he's fixing the flag like all commanders do when they land on Apollo. Now, I've drawn in two arrows that are split. I just labeled them one because I want to focus your attention to the area between those two arrowheads. And uh, what I'm going to do is to present the next picture where you can tell uh, where the uh, tip of the flag is. And then we work down lower from there just to keep you with the picture. No, that is not what, that's not the right picture. We're going all the way down. The, the one that I told you was there, it was, it was changed color to the point of not being recognizable. Uh, this is on Pete, so-called Pete, ab abdomen uh, on the left side. And arrow one points to um, an edge of a sort of a crater-like object in that dark area. That, that dark area two is, um, uh, well, first the two is a protrusion out of the dark area, which is sort of like a cavity. And then the three points to some material that goes down to the ground or the surface of the moon. And so this, this growth that you see here um, is a huge thing. It goes to the moon. You can see how it uh, goes up north up here. Um, if that's Pete, he didn't live. But, but we know that he came back. And so again, we have a situation where um, we thought we saw an astronaut, but it was not an astronaut. It was something else. Okay, and then we go to the, uh, the lunar modules on the moon, and I'm going to show you three of these. Now, the get times, I don't know if you can read them. I can't read them from here. But anyway, there's a question about whether the pictures are in the right order for the progressing, progressing uh, get times. Uh, get means a ground elapsed time. That is, since they blasted off, that's how many hours, uh, minutes, and seconds that they have been away from the ground. OK, now you see the limb on the um, horizon. And it sort of looks like the limb. And uh, three points it out again, but in the foreground, why uh, down here low is the color calibrator for color processing the pictures, and it's called the Nomi. 
And then there's the mobile transporter, which is sort of like a wheelbarrow uh, on this flight, on this mission to carry stuff around. Uh, it was a, sort of an awkward thing. But anyway, our interest is out there on the horizon. And here's, here's another shot out there on the horizon. And item two, again, is the color cal calibrator, um, the Nomi. Now, they've cut off the, uh, the top part of this. If they could lower that picture, it, it's way off. Because what I'm going to show you is, um, no, it's going the wrong way. There we go. OK, this is the lander on, on Apollo 11. And what I wanted you to notice is that this octagon shape lies a long way above the ground. Okay, and then we're going to compare that uh, visual memory with this. Now, this is uh, the first picture I showed you uh, out there on the horizon for the limb. Uh, we do see an octagon shape here, so that should be that shape that I showed you on Apollo 11. But there is some other growth around here, there's growth under here. And here's something out here that uh, is strange, is uh, oddball formation. Um, but that does purport to be the, uh, the limb. OK, matters get worse here. Uh, now this one, I think, should be the last one uh, to, to correspond to the last get time. But this one is fully developed. And uh, you see now this octagon shape touches the ground. It's not high up like the octagon shape for Apollo 11. And um, then you'd have some sort of a, a cross bar that's black that, that is connecting this with that. And you can see it has a strange development of, of stuff that's sticking out here. Uh, and. Uh, it has more of a structure of a little tree, you might say. Now this is the in-between one, which I think should be between the first one and the one I just showed you, because then that represents a progression of growth through there. And uh, to have it go from something to fully developed and back to something uh, halfway in between doesn't strike me as being correct. Uh, but nevertheless, um, that's the way they've got it. And you see this now is only a, about a foot, I would guess, above the lunar surface. But you can see more of the character of this thing. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a funny looking structure. Uh, and uh, okay, so I think the mission that had been planned for this was that they wanted us to know that they're capable of, uh, of making a replica that looks like uh, something we've got. Uh, and they are very smart on, on shading of light. And uh, so you end up with, with uh, things that look like elements that we know. And yet they are very strange. OK, now if you can't read anything on this uh, map, that's all right, because I couldn't either. Um, what I want to do now is just simply to orient you uh, geographic-wise. Uh, the center of the picture is the zero meridian, and across here, the equator. Uh, this thing is stretched out laterally uh, to include 180 degrees clear over to this side and 180 degrees clear over to this side. So it packs everything in about Mars there. And uh, now the Helena's Basin um, right in here. And uh, that is a, a, a marker for where we're going to take a look at a, another Mars photo. and. Uh, if you realize that um, the 
opportunity is around the rover, is around the um, zero position on Mars, and the other one is like 180 degrees opposite, it would put it on the very edge of this picture. And so uh, I, I wanted to get that concept of where you are so that if uh, the rover or spirit were on Mars when the next picture was taken, they would have got inundated, uh, particularly um, spirit. Okay, now what you see here is uh, a picture of Mars. It was shot from a distance of about 6.3 million miles. And can you bring up the light on that one a little bit? Okay, uh, so this is the North Pole and the South Pole is down here somewhere. But, but you see there's strange growth through here and you begin to wonder uh, just what that is. And so going on, now, yeah, there we go. Now what we see here is between these four arrows, there's an elliptical, elliptical uh, shape. Now that I marked as the nose. And it goes back, you can see that it goes back to here. And so I put a little dash mark as to the top line of, of the body. Uh, now here, here's a rising streamer. And here's a lateral projection. And uh, so what, what we've got there, a basis of what we know uh, are characteristics of an EMV. We got a, an EMV right in that area. And all kinds of things. Once it's there, you get all kinds of things that happen. You know, you got this thing going up and then it can give emissions and anything down this way, it can give emissions and uh, so forth. And you can see that there's a lot of structure impacting here. And um, uh, it looks like even that uh, not all of Mars is there. Uh, OK, so in, in uh, lining up with respect to this picture, NASA says this is uh, Hellas Basin, which is what I just showed you on that other map where it was located. And so now you're looking over to the right from Hellas Basin and uh, 180 degrees away would put you up in here, and um, that would be about where uh, spirit would be. And were spirit there under these circumstances, it certainly would not have lasted very long. And so it's not too surprising, not too surprising to find that our rovers are in trouble. Now here's a photograph of the moon taken during the Apollo 13 mission. Uh, how do you like that? Uh, what is going on here is that there's an object up in here and it's uh, putting out some, well, this is sort of like a laser light uh, streamer. Uh, and this is a big member that you, if you look closely up in here, you can see that it's, it's connected to a body and it goes down into here and uh, puts out uh, something you can see right in here that, that's pretty husky. And uh, now what I found out in working this up that when you have something like this adjacent to the moon, it is definitely affected. And there's a crossbar down here, this light, uh, this thing comes, uh, the projection from up top side comes down into here and then there's a, an offshoot from there. And so this part of the moon is aff uh, affected. So that you have a, a right angle area on the moon that is definitely affected by the presence of one of these EMVs. Um, so you see the, uh, the moon is not a, a, uh, a very hostile place. It's actually hostile. And to, to, be, to be there, you're gonna be exposed to some things I think that you don't wanna be exposed to. 
Now, I put this in, in is to sort of uh, make you realize, if you will, uh, where we are. Over to the left is a, a right flyer, and uh, over to the right is a, a jet airplane, a symbolic airplane. These are kites, and I flew the kites, and I challenged myself to get them both up there side by side. And uh, that's what happened here. And um, so we all know what the right flyer looked like and its capabilities, and we know what a jet fire can do, but we got something that is way, way beyond uh, the jet fighter capability. Okay, now we're going to go into um, the concept of civilizations. Uh, there is a gent in, in the Soviet Union, and he's now in Russia, of course, uh, and I believe it's the same one in his paper I read when I was doing the foreign technology work. Um, his name is Kardashev. Uh, Nikolai Karashev. Uh, he proposed, uh, what I saw in the paper, he originally proposed that uh, a societal IQ is proportional to the amount of energy that you can uh, successfully manage. In other words, uh, if you can manage nuclear power successfully uh, and you had been not doing that, uh, you stepped up to that, why your IQ just went up. And uh, since that time, why um, uh, there is a fellow, Kaku, a physicist, who locked on to some of, uh, Kaku, on, on some of the work of, of, of Nikolai. And Nikolai has stated that um, okay, there's a type one situation of civilization, a type two civilization, and a type three. And of course, there's a type zero, and that's what we are. And um, so we're going to define this. Now, a, a type one situation is where uh, a society can manage all the resources on Earth. And here's a picture of Earth, and you have storms and weather. You're supposed to manage all of that to, to, to be entitled to be called a class or a type one uh, society. Now, if you're a type two society, uh, then you've got to be able to uh, show that you can manage all the resources of the sun. How do you like that? Uh, now, that projection up at the top um, shows that uh, it, it, it's a huge thing. I think I calculated like 80 diameters, something like that, Earth diameter. Um, and it even looks like, in the way they've got it presented here, that there, there's a big object in here. Uh, so it would be interesting that, uh, to find that uh, we have the sun made up of uh, something else other than just uh, a nuclear fusion pot. Uh, and that's, that's my belief, uh, and it's, it's good that they've, they've done this. It looks also like this might be an EMV in there. And it's got the underneath stuff. It's uh, got a little circular area. This could be an overhead thing and also account for that wisp. So it looks like uh, uh, that the sun is not what we think it should be. And um, I am grateful for their color tuning of that to, to bring that element out. Okay, so now the sun is a situation where the type twos manage all of that energy, okay? And then you go to type three, and a type three civilization is supposed to be able to manage all the resources of a galaxy. And, you know, that's quite a jump. That's quite a step forward, but that's, that's the way Nikolai Kardashev uh, has defined this. And uh, when you consider that the, the distance across a galaxy, then that's our galaxy, the Milky Way, 100,000 light years, hey, that's a, that's a big uh, area to travel in. How would you like to be managing something that was 100 years, uh, 100,000 years across? It's, a, <coughs> its thickness 
was only 10,000 light years, and the thick part is like 30,000 light years. Okay, going on. Okay, here is my graph of what I call the physicist's playground. Um, now, down at the bottom here, uh, what we've got, well, first let me explain the overall thing. Uh, I put in the perspective type one situation, type two, type three, and give an indication of where Earth fits into this pattern. Okay, now you've got sort of the overall view. Now, let's look at uh, what the various things represent. Along the bottom of this is, uh, records all the visible energy that the universe provided, and the, that large number is here. And that energy was provided at the beginning of time. So this line is really the beginning of time. Okay. Now, on the uh, vertical axis, um, what you have is these types of civilizations. You see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And if you can think also that those numbers are figures of merit or, or, or identifying numbers for the, uh, the level of their IQ, it's all the same thing. Uh, it's that the civilization, civilization type is discrete. And it's discrete because they tie the energy that you're to control to those three different types of objects that I uh, told you about. And so those energies, like for Saturn, it's right down here. And for the sun, it's right there. So. Saturn and the Sun are very close, and so Saturn really is justified in being a type two, called a type two. <coughs> okay, so Earth down here, uh, is it a type one? Well, no, not quite. We only manage energy that's at the seven-tenths level. I would say we are about a seven-tenths type of situation on this in the, uh, to, to gradu put graduate marks on, uh, on, on that scale. Um, okay, so you go out to the Milky Way and sure enough, the energy of that falls right there. So in checking the energy for these three points, uh, they fell in a straight line in a plot like this. And that made me feel very happy because when you have three points in a straight line, it makes it easy to extrapolate. And <clears throat> so uh, you, I extrapolated primarily upward there. And uh, the dashed line is the extrapolation and it ends up on the beginning of timeline um, at about six and a half. So uh, if you were to manage all the energy in the universe, you'd have to be a civilization of about six and a half a caliber. Um, now a question arose as to uh, where God is in this picture. Um, and the question arises, uh, does he have infinite intelligence or is it something less than infinity? Okay, so the curve is broken up here, and at the top, there is infinity. Um, I, I consider this top corner where the horizontal line that comes across and, and the beginning of time when intersect, that little intersection, I call that God's corner. Um, because it's infinite, uh, he knows everything, and uh, he created the universe, which is essentially what that means. Uh, time goes from right to left, and so over in here, the time would be about uh, something in the neighborhood of 15 billion years. And so you can see that it takes quite a bit of time to, for these things to happen. Uh, just the, the vertical separation between um, Earth and where we are now in terms of 
of producing energy uh, that re represents quite a quite a span of years, and so it also gives you some idea that uh, you know we're not going to get very far very fast unless we really wanted to do it. So now I want to try to give you a little flavor of physicist thinking, and um, I got intrigued with uh, Kaku's presentation. Um, now. It turns out that the starting point for Einstein's work was really the Pythagoras uh, theory. And probably most of you know what that is. Namely, if you have a right triangle up here, um, you take the, the side here and make a square out of it. You call you, that area of that square based on that one side plus the area based on the other side is equal to the hypotenuse, the long side of a triangle, and the total area. So these two areas here of the opposite side equals the area of the hypotenuse. Okay, so you can just say that eight squared then is equal to um, y squared and x squared plus. Okay, now the big point of that is only that it's two dimensions there, x and y, are just two dimensions. And uh, it's a planar kind of approach. Okay, so now how do you bring this up into 10 dimensions? And, and we'll show you how it's, it's being done. Okay, here is a three dimensional case. And so you do the same thing, you get X, Y, and Z for the different, and you add those all together and you get the length of that long line extending from one corner to the furthest opposite corner. And um, so that's, that's the relationship that, that is there. Now, if you want to go to four dimensions like uh, Einstein did, well, you simply throw in another term. And in this case, it was T squared. And so now he has four dimensions. He doesn't know whether physically or not it means anything, but he's got four dimensions. And, um, and so since he doesn't know what to call the resultant, he just calls it space-time because you don't know what that resultant is all about. Now, if you want to go to 10 dimensions, I tried to make up a, a quick way to do that, but what it means is you have 10 terms and each of them are squared terms and you can substitute all other kinds of equations in each of the 10 terms. But uh, you set it up so it's 10-dimensional, and that's what the physicists believe that they're doing now. Um, I'd like to hark back to say that for um, the, the type 2 civilization, uh, Bob Dean uh, tweaked me uh, on, on that kind of uh, situation, and um, I, I agree on his statement that um, there is in existence uh, a type two civilization, maybe it's a, even a type three, uh, according to what we saw there with the sun. So uh, there is very great high intelligence kicking around the universe. Now, it's a question of whether the physicists can come up with a theory of everything. And now, mind you, what has happened here is Everything is based on the Pythagoras theorem. And, and the math guys like it because they get a plus and minus out of every square. So when you take the square root, it's either plus or minus. And so if you have energy, it can be either plus or minus. And so it makes a neat thing, but mind you, it's just geometry, nothing more, just geometry. Okay, uh, here, are the things that uh, the physicists are trying to do to plug uh, their 10-dimensional theory. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard for me to read it. I don't know. Can you all see it? Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, space time is the first one. And that's, that's Einstein. So Einstein blocked himself out four right at the beginning. Now, the rest of them are what the physicists want to include to make up the 10. And uh, 
you go down those and you come to quantum theory, that, that has given the physicists a lot of trouble because uh, that essentially says that uh, their systems are going to be digitized. Uh, the string theory, they believe they need something else to explain uh, how things get started and they're hoping that um, some sort of string will show up in, in the cosmos. Well, uh, we got an EMV that is capable of making strings, so they have no problem that way. And it's a question of whether they think it's appropriate to incorporate it. But uh, right now, there, there's no realization as to why uh, uh, an EMV type of thing should be recognized. And uh, the data are there, it's an open secret, but uh, uh, I guess the question of, well, I know it, but don't bother me with facts. Um, now, uh, the, uh, this thing is a little too high, but these are acknowledgments. And um, it's hard for me to read it. Okay. All right, you can go through those, you can see it. And all right, there, there are three women that are omitted from this, and I want to give them credit. One is my wife, who has spent a lot of uh, lonesome hours while I've been trying to put a lot of this stuff together. Uh, another is Judy Donnelly in Washington, D.C., who was my first president of the California, California uh, Civil Engineers Society. And um, she, uh, this was an education foundation, and she became president of the Education Foundation. And the third is uh, Casey Dawkins, Marilyn Casey Dawkins, who uh, has had a touch of her in, in most everything that I've presented. Okay, take home thoughts. I hope you can read that. And uh, we're running out of time. Okay, a closing thought by Stephen Hawking. Uh, he's claiming here that the only one would be if we can figure out something for everything, theory for everything, and then we'd know the mind to God. Um, I think that's a little overstatement, but that's in the right direction. And here's my idea of where we are. Um, we have a little rover here looking under Adirondack, and, but in the meantime, why we got this huge EMV in the background with a laser pointing down to the surface. And I, I think that's about contrast, the, the technology. Okay, lights. We're all through.